those around him. Howard Hughes did the scene, and the plane came down. And that was a first significant concussion for Howard Hughes. Upon impact, his face and forehead smashed into the cockpit dashboard, causing trauma to the orbital frontal cortex, which sits over the eye sockets. This is an area of the brain that handles error detection in humans. When we think something's a little off and need to correct it. When this area is deprived of oxygen, a person's sense of error detection may be thrown off. They may begin checking and double-checking their actions to make sure they haven't made a mistake or to get something perfect. This happened to Howard Hughes, and it's one of the secrets to understanding what made him tick. Lectures, Making Your Mind, Molecules, Motion, and Memory, will be given by Dr. Eric Kandel, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Columbia University, and Dr. Thomas Jessel, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator also at Columbia University. The first test flight was on the 7th of July, 1946. The plane functioned perfectly for 45 minutes as Hughes soared above the Los Angeles basin, flying higher and further than scheduled. Suddenly, a propeller malfunction caused it to plummet. Hughes wrestled with the controls, hoping to land on a fairway of the Los Angeles Country Club. He fought the plane and uh, lost the battle and came down through a house in Beverly Hills near the golf course there and it was a big fiery crash. People thought Howard Hughes was gonna die. And he wound up in the hospital uh, fighting for his life. And his doctor said to him, well, we don't wanna lie to you. Your chances aren't good. And Howard Hughes said, well, I'm prepared. Hughes was uh, ready to die after that plane crash. He went on to live 30 years. Thirty years later, at his autopsy, doctors found shocking physical evidence of the accident. What's important about the crash is it was going to emotionally resonate with him. The fact that somebody died, it was during a time when Hughes was starting to have some mental issues. He doesn't know what it is. He thinks he's going crazy. More and more, Hughes was exhibiting odd patterns of behavior. Compulsive washing to avoid germs, which he did since childhood. Checking and rechecking his work and his instructions to others. Always seeking symmetry and constantly trying to make things perfect. Few recognized or understood the symptoms then. But today, years after his death, this behavior points to a revealing diagnosis Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD. He uses pretty much an encyclopedia of symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, he, there's hardly a symptom you can mention that he didn't have. But OCD was not commonly known during Hugh's lifetime, so it went completely undiagnosed and untreated. As he grew older, his symptoms became more extreme and his behavior more bizarre. It really all is consistent because the head injuries would tend to just make the OCD worse. During the 1940s, friends and business associates wondered what was going on with Hughes. Some called him eccentric, but others thought there might be something really wrong. Howard Hughes spent nearly three years completing Hells Angels, reshooting many scenes, and editing the film almost non-stop at all hours of night and day. To those around him, he was completely obsessed and compulsively driven to make a perfect film. Little did anyone realize that this was an early sign that something was amiss with the young millionaire. 
he would go in the screening room, he would he would literally cut apart these films frame by frame, and he just didn't have the psychological makeup that would say to him, hey, this, th you know, this is making everybody's life miserable. It's making this production go way over budget. He didn't care. He, he just wanted to get it the way he wanted it to be. Costing $4 million, dollars, Hell's Angels finally premiered on the 30th of January, 1930, with Hughes hiding in the shadows of the theater. Hell's Angels, the opening of this picture at Brahman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, was the biggest premiere ever seen anywhere in the world before or since. 500,000 people are lining the street. The film was a huge success. Viewers were awestruck by the flying sequences, the best ever filmed, according to some critics. This reinforced Hughes' urge for perfection and propelled him to his next career goal in the field of aviation. The first lecture is titled Mapping Memory in the Brain. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the 2008 Holiday Lectures on Science. The Institute initiated this series in 1993. In 1995, I had the pleasure of coming here and delivering the lectures on catalytic RNA. And since I've been president of the Institute, it's been a great pleasure to be involved in choosing 18 terrific scientists to talk to uh, students here in the auditorium. Eric Kandel and Tom Jessel are both longtime Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators at Columbia University in New York City. In these lectures, Eric and Tom will open a window on cutting edge research into how the brain develops and how it functions to mediate our movements, our perceptions, and our innermost thoughts and memories. It's an honor to introduce Eric Kandel to deliver our first lecture. New York is heaven. I mean, I like Paris, but there's nothing like New York. And the academic scene in New York, uh, Columbia, NYU, Rockefeller, Mount Sinai, Einstein, it's just absolutely terrific. Good morning. Thank you very much for your gracious introduction, Tom. Uh, Tom Jessel and I are delighted to have the opportunity provided by these holiday lectures to interact with you over the next two days. I will begin our discussion of mind this morning by considering learning and memory, two of the most magical properties of mind, because they're central to our existence. They make us who we are. They shape our knowledge. Learning, as you know, is the process whereby we acquire new information about the world, and memory is the process whereby we hold on to that information over time. Most of the information we have about the world and most of our skills are not born into our brains, but are acquired through learning. We learn the faces and names of our parents, our sibling, our friends. We learn the logic of algebra, the capability to dance, to engage in sports, to read music, to play the piano, to remember the words of the Star Spangled Banner. It was the first of many peculiar disappearing acts throughout his life. Without telling anyone, Hughes went to Fort Worth, Texas, and using an alias, took a job as a baggage handler for American Airlines. Within a few weeks, he was promoted to co-pilot. Hughes continued the charade until he was finally recognized. It was an unusual dalliance. Some think he did it to study the inner workings of an airline, that he would later buy one, TWA. But others think it was just another indulgence, Howard doing what he wanted to do, because he could. Once his cover was blown, Hughes returned to California, not to make movies in Hollywood, but to build airplanes in Culver City and fly them himself. Making your mind, molecules, motion, and memory. We are in large part who we are because of what we learn and what we remember. Thank you. Thank you. 